Let me turn my Wi-Fi off everywhere else. Okay, so it should be if I refresh. We are live. We are live. Yeah. Okay, let's go on my account to make sure. Yeah, I see it. Retweet. Oh, exciting. Nice. <gasps> there we are. I just saw us. And we're live. Cool. Look at us. Oh. Look at us. Yeah. Making wow. things happen. That's so cool. I didn't know we could do that. That is amazing. <laughs> All right. If you are here. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Pin it. That's a good idea. Yeah. Pin it. Um, if you are here, leave a comment that you're here and say hi. So they can't verbally speak, right? They no, it's just, write. yeah, it's just they get a, uh, they can leave comments, live comments. All right. Either from YouTube or Twitter. Cool. Okay, let me go on my other account and retweet. I'm going to make some changes to my screen just so that I can look at both at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're watching, make sure to leave a comment that you're here. Tell us where you're, where you're watching from, what your name is. This is four people, but I don't know. It's probably. All right. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my first live stream. I am nervous. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm here with Russ. He is so patient with Hello, me. Hello, guys. So patient. Yeah. <laughs> We're figuring out. It's my first time streaming. Um, we wanted to do a live stream. I've been wanting to do a live stream um, with Twitter. And I also wanted to talk more about trauma. And I got really peaked from the last time that Russ and I spoke. He was my first uh, guest on my podcast. And we talked about ADHD and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. But we really touched a little bit on it. I said, I want to go a lot more deeper. I want to learn more about it. And I had to bring Russ back on because this is his life's work. He does his podcast about ADHD and CPTSD. And yes, it's different from PTSD, right? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's the same training. same principle, but different different ways of how it starts. So that's what we're gonna get into today. We're gonna we're gonna he's gonna talk. He's gonna tell you. I'm just gonna ask questions and learn along with you guys. He is going to tell you what is the difference between CPTSD and and PTSD, and and how it impacts our lives. When did it start? What are the symptoms? Who's affected? How is it treated? Uh, and hopefully, if you guys have any questions, leave it in the comments. Uh, and we will try to answer them as we see them. So yeah, let's start Excellent. with the basic definition. What is complex post-traumatic stress disorder? Okay. Complex post-traumatic stress disorder is similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. The idea is the same. You suffer flashbacks from trauma that you have experienced, but the difference is whereas with post-traumatic stress disorder, Typically, it's a significant event, whether it's uh, like a like a natural disaster. Uh, it's if you've been in uh, a battle or a war and you're around um, gunfire, you see extreme death or disfigurement. Um, a lot of police officers and ambulance, uh, um, people like that, nurses, even doctors, they if they see a really significant event that is traumatic to them or even to another person and they witness it and their memory kind of grabs onto it and it's yeah. really stressful and it, it, which is the whole reason as to why it's, it's traumatic because it's, it's extreme. It's not nor like not a normal thing that you experience. So they they don't even necessarily know right away that they have it or that they, they've experienced it but then it's in the future 
where they start experiencing rela- like a flashback and and it, and it can be directly related to at the time that they're doing their work or it could be like at night where they have a dream or something that maybe not even necessarily related to it at all can trigger them and they believe that they're in like they're actually at that point again like they're re-experiencing that reliving the trauma event Mm -hmm. yeah exactly so they're in they're not in place and in time they're in a they believe they're there now instead of in real time Mm -hmm. so that's that's the post-traumatic stress disorder from one particular traumatic event now Mm -hmm. complex post-traumatic stress disorder another word that's or term that some people use is childhood traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic mm-hmm. stress disorder because mm-hmm. um a majority or i would i wouldn't say all the cases but a good majority of the of the cptsd diagnosis are from childhood related trauma and the major difference now is that it is repeated events at an early age that are um, traumatic are dangerous, uh, and it comes from signs of physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, uh, extreme neglect. Um, it can even be repeated events that that person experienced. So like, let's say that child is going to a daycare or a babysitter and that, that babysitter is abusive Hmm. and it's every time that they're there, they they come up, they're developing um, coping mechanisms as a child to try and protect themselves when this event is occurring or when these, these abuse events or traumatic events are occurring. And this is so repetitive, like chronic repeated events, like abusive events throughout their childhood or into their like early teens. It, you know, it depends on, on how long it goes for it, but it doesn't necessarily matter the length of time is just repeated events. And then later on in their life, it could, and it could be in their, like when they're 18 or 20 something, or even for like myself in my thirties, mm-hmm. where a, an event, something that is very stressful or very anxious, like high anxiety or like, so, like, experiencing uh health related problems that are causing a high amount of stress it can suddenly it's like a sudden trigger right and it and Mm -hmm. then it brings it out into to your life and then now all of a sudden you start having memories and you start having flashbacks to your like your childhood trauma and that's where the CPT, CPTSD comes to play. Mm-hmm. It basically is you start having flashbacks and just like PTSD, you're now reliving you're now behaving. Yeah, you're reliving it. Exactly. Right. And so you're not in place and in time. You think you you think that you're actually the child that you that you event that you're mm-hmm. you're experiencing is is mm-hmm. happening when you were five years old instead of when you're 21 or, or 34, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. that's, that's the, I could go into great detail, but I, we're not going to, well, I won't do that here. Yeah. You have to check his podcast for the more in detail stuff. He's always Absolutely. looking at the latest research and sadly, there's not that much research on CPTSD specifically. It's not even a the DSM five is what you told me the last time we talked. Correct. Yes, it's it's not officially recognized in the mm-hmm. U.S. in the DSM five, mm-hmm. and this is specifically like you have had had to had trauma from childhood for it to be yeah. categorized as complex post traumatic. Well, it can be order. childhood. It can be. It could also be in your teenage years your too. Teenage years. It's, mm-hmm. it's just the the vast majority of the diagnoses that are occurring today, and, and since the discovery tends to be from childhood because that's when the brain is developing. That's when the memories are like, that's when we learn the most and we, our development is, is at its peak. Right. So that's yeah. when it tends to be more common. Um, so when did we first start talking about CPTSD? Do you know? 
Like what, what was it? Oh, um, I think it was quite a long, I don't know the exact year mm -hmm. roughly. I know that it was something that's been discussed for quite a long time. Um, but because society and research and, and the understanding of the human mind has been come, has become more prevalent and much more like known, mm -hmm. the understanding of it is much better today. Like they, they understood, but they really didn't have a good grasp by any means as to what it was and why it existed. They just, because there were, there were, if, if people knew about it as much as today, back 70, 80 years ago, there would probably, we are, we'd probably be so advanced mm -hmm. compared to the way to how we are now. Mm -hmm. um, that's just, the, that's just the bottom line is that our knowledge and understanding of it has really, taken off in the last 10, 20 years. And that's evident by there's starting to be more and more psychologists and psychiatrists who have training and expertise in CPTSD. Mm. And yeah, 10 years ago, you might have had a heck of a time finding anybody, you know, because it wasn't necessarily common by any means. It was, it was, a, it was still in its infancy as far as research and, and theories. Can someone who uh, maybe doesn't have a specialization in CPTSD, but has, but is a trauma focused therapist or psychologist, can they provide support to somebody with CPTSD? Uh, they can, mm -hmm. but there's a risk that the support, will be more harmful than good. Why is that? Because the, the understanding of it and the methods that they would use to treat complex mm -hmm. trauma mm -hmm. won't be effective. It will. And, and there's lots of examples out there, both. Give us just I've one example. Of, okay. Well, I know, I know someone who went through multiple years of, trauma therapy but it was it was the under this it was not cptsd related trauma and or for that she didn't realize that that time that that's what she had mm -hmm. and the the related therapy was like cbt right where instead so it's a it's a different kind of therapy and and it it doesn't work because what we what you determine when you when you start to research and you understand cptsd and there's different theories about cptsd but they all sort of kind of lead to the same root where when we're that child we have parts and specifically we have child parts that are born at that time that their sole purpose is to protect us in the moments of the abuse or the trauma. Mm -hmm. And you can, there are people out there who are so severely traumatized that they develop uh, a, a severe um, form of it called dissociative identity disorder, mm. which is where they have different identities that are so strong and so present that the person the original, like the an, uh, original person who had the trauma has no memories at all of what happened for the length of time that that other identity was, was present. So they literally feel like they blacked out and woke up all of a sudden goes, where am I? What happened? What's, oh, wow. you know, it's that severe. And there are actual videos on YouTube of, mm -hmm. of people who have DID that they literally, should they, they, they switch personalities and they're a completely different person and they, and they are different, different tone, different voice, different personality. It's very amazing. Yeah. And it's actually, and, and it's a real thing. And that's on the very severe end of, yeah. of the traumatic response. Mm -hmm. And that's the theory, the one that I am working with and that uh, the person that I know that I've been talking about, 
their form of, th of therapy is dissociative, uh, sorry, dissociation, structural association theory or structural association model where it's four step processing and they have child parts that are, are in separate locations in the brain mm -hmm. and they all have like their sole purpose, each, each part, and there's multiple parts, their sole purpose is to protect the that adult or that child in that mm -hmm. when they were born. Right. And the reason that we have the triggers and we have the flashbacks is those parts are coming online and are taking over and they're behaving, but they think that it's 1987 or 1991 when they were, when they first came online and they were born, they think they're in a time when that, when the child is, or that person is that child and they mm -hmm. don't know that that's, he's now an adult and his behavior is like, it's honorable and it's, it's great that it's behave it, that it's doing what it's doing, but it's in the wrong, it's not in time and place. And so it has potential to be inappropriate or dangerous for that person. Wow. It reminds me of the, the, the stages of development by Erickson um, mm. because trauma and, and I talked about this, I think I mentioned it in, in the podcast that we did together and I linked it, but um, I know that when someone experiences trauma, a normal person that doesn't experience trauma, like um, goes through these developmental stages and you're supposed as you age, you kind of graduate to a different stage. You learn different different things, different coping tools, different things that you're supposed to just uh, mature into. But when you have trauma, it stunts the growth of your brain, right. basically, and it stunts yeah. your developmental growth. So if you um, had trauma when you were in, and I don't remember the names of, maybe I can just Google it. Uh, um, uh, let's say that you um, had trauma in in middle school and, 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 you, and there's a name for that, for that um, section of life you get stuck in that middle school mindset. That's, that's why you you see a lot of people that are adults, but they are, are emotionally immature. You see them, they're adults, but they have, but they behave like kids sometimes. They may not know how to process emotions because they didn't know they didn't, that part of their brain got stunted by the trauma that happened to them, which is something that I had to recognize in myself, which is something that my, before my therapist went on maternity leave, we were starting to explore and it didn't happen which actually right. I just called a, a trauma therapist. I don't know if they have complex. I don't know if they have any CPTSD. Um, Cause I, I mean, I've, I've to be very um, vulnerable here on here. Like I've experienced trauma since I was very little, like three years old and like several wow. other bunch of stuff happened. Like in my whole life. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure that I'm probably somebody who has not, maybe not the, the, the severe kind where you're like don't remember but like yeah. there's just no way i don't have this because i've just ex experienced so much and there was like rep some of the stuff was like repetitive like bullying for example like that can yeah. somebody that um that had bullying when they were like in elementary school and middle school can they suffer from something like cptsd absolutely mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be at the beginning of your life in the first few years, it can, cause I had multiple stages myself. Like mm -hmm. I, my, the beginning of my traumatic events, which caused CP, you know, my CPTSD was mm -hmm. from my childhood, mm -hmm. but it, it progressed further in school. So I, I had it, I was being bullied and I had misunderstood like a misunderstanding in school and as I went through my years of school and everything, you know, you progress, you get, you get to a stage where people know who you are and you, they learn your behaviors. And, and I became traumatized at school and bullied and harassed and lied to and teased and everything. And it, it just added on to it. Like it made it more complex no pun intended. It's just, it, it made it worse. And, yeah. and it, as yet there's evidence when past like post high school, right? Like you, I always used to think that it was just like, because I was bullied, I 
learn to avoid people or I learn to, I, you know, I was naturally shy or I was naturally not a very communicative person or very talkative. And I, and you don't realize how back, how far back it goes, how, how deep the root of, of the trauma is until you, mm -hmm. until you sit down and you learn about it and you have someone help you identify where things are from. And yeah. once, once you know, like you understand CPTSD, like, and when I say understand, I mean, you get the basics that are important enough to help you no, understand where what is happening to you then you're able to finally see this here is cause of is why this happened and this is mm -hmm. and this is why this behavior today is is existing because it's a flashback to when you're five years old mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it it goes very deep but you won't truly understand it until you've got a grasp on complex trauma Right. And I want to go on another little tangent. I go on a lot of little tangents, so bear with me. But I was thinking yeah. one of my episodes that I worked on was a why we our brains tend to lead negative. Like we tend to focus on the negative. And I, I, I can only imagine that someone that has experienced trauma has this a, a heightened in them where they can only focus on negative stimulus. And right. it it went back into our, you know, caveman times where our bodies are designed, like our brains are designed to keep us alive, right? So we still have those, is that what you were saying? Like the mechanism in our brain that it literally is there to make us survive. And sometimes it gets confused by things like trauma, which is kind of what yeah. it, it sounds like what you're saying to me. And it makes us a little bit, it just changes the way that our brains work. It, it changes neural pathways, the way that we behave, it changes our behavior. Like it actually changes your brain almost physically inside. Like, this Absolutely. Is how it does. It literally it does. does. Yes. Can we talk more about how our struct, the brain structures change because of trauma? Okay, sure. All right. When we're, when we're a child, obviously our brains are just developing, right? Like mm -hmm. we go through our stages we we go through communication stages we learn how to talk we learn we our memories we start to have actual memories stay in our mind um then what happens is is when you start having like when you're experiencing trauma and like any form of it and and repetitively you start to ex like your experiences are developing memories and those parts, when they become active, like when they get, when your part comes online and it's, and it says, okay, this child is in danger. I have to protect it. So it does what it needs to do, which, and it could be anything like it's not one thing every time, right? It's, it could be where it learns how to negotiate with that person or learns how to uh, block out like, right, like, so that it doesn't, it has no memory of it or, or dissociate so that it thinks about something else or pretends or plays a game. Like it's, there's dozens and dozens of different examples. And so that child now one takes a part of the brain, like a, a little spot in the, in their brain and it develops in there. And one is it separate it doesn't, it's not linked with the child itself. So it develop. it has memories of that, tra that trauma of the experiences and the child itself doesn't because the other part is now taking, has taken over and is doing its role to, like to said, to protect that, that, that individual. So this is where in later in life, this is where the problem comes up. Like, is because the adult, the child who's now the adult has no actual memory of the event because the child part is the, it was the, was the one that had the memories experienced the, the trauma and the, and the abuse. But there's like a little kind of like almost like a single thread. Right. And, and, but it's not enough for them to be able to know each other. Like they don't know who they are. 
they have no ability to experience the memories they literally that's which is why the work that you you do is designed to one get to know the part understand what happened and then you have to trust like you have to you have to up, update that part saying like literally like telling them that today is now whatever date right today is now july 24 2022 i am no longer five years old i am now 44 um, i'm an adult i take care of myself i'm no longer in danger like you're you're updating the part so that it understands that its role in your life was awesome it was amazing it did a great job but because the adult now is in control and is safe that that part can now you know doesn't have to take control doesn't have to come online and do what is what they thought was required because they don't realize that it's a different date different time and so the whole step is to gain the trust of that part so that it believes the adult and then what that does is that starts the integration of the neural network like pathways in the brain so eventually that part over time they'll kind of become one and they'll, mm-hmm. so that you're, you're fully integrated, right? So that now yeah. the adult has all the memories mm-hmm. of, of the child part and all the events and the trauma. And then the child part now is aware that it's not 1982, it's 2012. And that wow. the adult is, is in control. He's safe. We're not in danger anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's like a process, right? That's amazing. That That's so fascinating to me. Like I, the whole science behind it and how our brains record events and emotions, like it's just yeah. absolutely fascinating to me how our parts of our brains hold its own memories and, and then kicks in because that's, it's just, that's its job. And sometimes it's overactive. Like that's why we have anxiety because our nervous systems are so hypersensitive because there's that part of the brain that has that negative memory that says, oh, we are always in danger because that is, I mean, I'm like having a moment right now. I'm <laughs> just like, that's crazy. <laughs> that's okay. um, yeah. Another tangent, another tangent, which is why I love positive affirmations so much. Cause it's like you were saying that like, you have to tell the brain that you're no longer, you're not in danger anymore. Yeah. And, which is why yeah. I like um, positive affirmations when I have anxiety and when I've had like moments where my PTSD was triggered during therapy sessions, like my therapist had to do like a, a laddering thing where she's like, where are you? I'm in my office. I am on my at home. Like, are you safe? I am safe. And so like, you have to say these things, like I am safe to tell your brain or that part of your brain, like you're, you're, you're specifically talking like about one specific section of the brain. I've always yeah. said like, Oh, I'm telling my brain you're safe. You don't have to be anxious. Your nervous system you can calm down. You don't have to protect me because I'm not in danger. But it, there's actually that one specific part of the brain that's responsible for that reaction because of that negative, similar like that negative event yeah. that happened. That stuff is so fascinating. Can we talk briefly about like the symptomology? Like when when now CPT is, is triggered in, in adulthood or, w- or whenever it hits you and it can hit whenever, right? It could hit you at yeah. any stage of your life in adulthood absolutely so when that happens like what kind of symptoms should we be on the lookout for well the the i it's kind of it's it's different for everybody not everybody has the same mm-hmm. physical and mental symptoms because it depends on the severity of it it depends on the situation that triggers them uh it like if if it was very severe then a lot of things and it doesn't even necessarily have to be related to the actual event or the trauma itself but it, any anything could trigger them and what ends up happening is they'll have like the i think the major change is the way that they're they're acting like the way that they present themselves. Like it's, it's slight, like it's not for a lot of people, it's not necessarily going to be a, a, ch- a major change. You're not going to see 
an obvious form, right? A lot of it tends to be um, verbal because that person is the way they they speak changes. Uh, communication can change. They could be having a very difficult time communicating, like getting getting a, their point across. They could be breathing heavy, like they could be pa- like they could be sweating a little bit because they're they're in a they're highly anxious or they're very stressed, right? Like they could they could be looking they could physically be looking around or be on high alert like they, they might be a little jumpy or they might be kind of fidgeting and moving around and not ha- having a difficult time sitting still uh they could even maybe start like showing emotional like crying or anger right like it's it it there's so many different possibilities um, they could also, if they could go the opposite route where they like literally become numb and they're almost like as if they're sitting still and not moving, not talking. Um, they look like they're completely zoned out. Like they have, they're not aware of anything going on. So, you know, it'd be almost like you could wave your hand in front of their eyes and, and they would, they wouldn't realize that you're doing it. Like, uh, you know, it's like they're completely out of their mind in a, in a physical sense, like it's if it would be easy if there were only maybe like a dozen possible explan- like things that could show up, but because everybody has slightly different uh, structures and they have different parts and they, and they all have their own meanings and they, everybody's different when it comes to how they present emotions and physical symptoms, it, it can vary. You have to learn. You kind of have yeah. to, get to know that person and know there's their signs that they're that they're mm-hmm. having a, a flashback so um what i know what i know from ptsd um one of the reasons why i struggled so much in getting an adhd diagnosis was because um ptsd and adhd have a lot of overlapping symptoms like Absolutely. not being able to uh remember stuff like being forgetful yeah. um anxiety uh i'm i'm blanking out right now I'm blanking That's out okay. right now <laughs> um yeah and like like little things like that like being anxious being jumpy being uh because and I'm, I'm familiar with the with the with the symptoms only because and i do social work and we, i've had to do several assessments and sometimes you have to do like the gad like uh the phq9 like all of those um mental health assessments and it'll ask yeah. questions when it comes to the ptsd part like do you feel like when you are in an area like you're getting physiological symptoms and you don't even know why your like heart is racing or why you're sweating or like it's all of these sometimes these symptoms are physiological and you and if you don't know why am i feeling like this it could be something like PTSD or CPTSD, especially if you, well, you know, it could be CPTSD if you experienced a trauma when you were younger, everything's great in life, but you're like, why am I feeling like this? It sounds like that's kind of how it would be. Would you agree? Hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. Um, I actually, I think I may have mentioned it briefly to you uh, the last time we talked and I don't know if it was on on air or if it was before, but I have done at least two podcasts uh, where I was discussing the fact that there's a lot of evidence and there's a lot of research that has come out now where there's where they're saying that a lot of adults who have been diagnosed with ADHD or even as in their childhood uh, with ADHD are now discovering that they actually suffered from childhood trauma as a child Mm -hmm. and developed their brain developed in a, in their, in a, such a certain way that it emulates and looks very much like ADHD Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. the way that the, the reason that they're saying this is that the an ADHD brain develops different than a neurotypical mind like brain because of like the frontal cortex or the frontal mm-hmm. lobe sorry in the, in the brain is where a lot of the ADHD related uh, issues occur mm-hmm. and they say that the the development due to the trauma and the and and the and the child parts and everything like that due to that happening, 
the similarities in the structure of the brain is is so very close Mm -hmm. that a lot of people are now realizing and i believe i am one of them that a lot of their adhd symptoms or almost all of them are due to complex trauma from childhood abuse it's and it's still relatively new like this is this Mm -hmm. is a very new thing so 10 years from now there's probably going to be a more complex diagnosis manual out there where someone's going to come in for an ADHD diagnosis and the psychiatrist's going to do more Mm -hmm. trauma related questions and investigating. And it may take two steps or two days to do it. Right. Right. Because they want to, they want to identify and rule out or, you know, say, okay, I think actually based on what you've told me, from your childhood and your past that you actually may have CPTSD and that is why you're having these symptoms that are looking a lot like ADHD. Interesting. They have, there's a lot more research involved because it's, it's like anything else. You just can't have one, one person do research and say, wow, I found this out. And then it becomes fact and, and, and the norm, right? It takes yeah. time for, for more and more people to learn that and right. to go, this makes sense. And then they mm-hmm. obviously, all the major leading experts in, in ADHD and CPTSD and trauma and, and everybody has to, they kind of have to, you know, go over it and go, this, this looks legit. This looks like it's for true, for real, mm-hmm. and it, but it takes time. And right. Unfortunately, I wish it wasn't so, so long. Yeah. And it sounds like, yeah, what what you told me last time was that it's still a a new, so there's a lot of research that needs to be done specifically to see what the the relativity is. And I actually was just watching a TikTok this morning where they were talking Mm. about um, trauma and how, um, how it causes it could it could cause ADHD. It could it could, and it makes so much sense. Like if you understand like how ADHD behaves in the brain or how an ADHD brain is developed from birth, um, the the neural pathways are they don't are they're not created how they're supposed to be. Right? Quotation was like the normal how the neurotypical way. And if you're born, so what I'm understanding is that if you're born neurotypical. Um, yeah. And then you experience trauma in your most crucial times of development. Those neural pathways begin to change. Absolutely. And then you start experiencing ADHD symptoms caused yeah. by the trauma. Yeah. That's like crazy. You could. I, exactly. Like you, you may not necessarily at one time, like at six years old, mm-hmm. you may not necessarily have very obvious symptoms especially like today it may be easier to to notice and to realize it like and diagnose it possibly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because more and more people like in in education and in life are better aware of it like a lot of schools have programs and situ- things in place to better be better, better prepared for this, this sort of thing. Right. Uh-huh. And back in my day, it was, you mentioned ADHD and I have a feeling the majority of them either had no idea what you're talking about or had very poor education when it came to it. And so they wouldn't have, they would not have had a clue. Uh-huh. And as far as I was concerned, when I was five, I thought I was just a very rambunctious, very adventurous, very crazy kind of a kid. And I was my way of being, I guess I want to say being controlled, but like living was, was being active and just being a kid, right? I didn't, it never occurred to me at that time that what was happening was causing it or developing it. And I always, for the longest time, even growing up and, and into adulthood, I thought I had a, and I had an issue 
with education or I wasn't paying attention and like I was being lazy or I didn't care. Mm. Or I was, you know, like it, it never occurred to me exa- at that exact moment that maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe it wasn't just that I didn't care or that I was, uh, I was easily distracted or I got bored or I thought it was too, it wasn't interesting enough. So I got bored. I, I didn't, none of that occurred to me. Mm-hmm. And, and it, and most of it is because my parents didn't know and my teachers didn't know. So nobody thought any different. It was, it was like, oh yeah, he's just bored or he, you know, he doesn't pay attention or he needs more discipline. It's, it's yeah. a, that's a common thing back then. Yeah. And that's why, and that speaks to why some women bec- go undiagnosed with ADHD because yeah. society says boys are boys. They are rambunctious. They're loud. They can't sit still. They're running around. You know, that's just kind of the culture. Like that's how boys are. Boys will be boys. And that kind of mentality normalizes behavior that otherwise if we didn't have that kind of mindset, like, like, well, this is not normal. We need to look, look deeper into it. And then, and women, you know, they're not raised like that. They're not, um, they're not stigmatized in that way. They're like, oh, they're quiet. They're, 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 they're taught to be quiet. That's how they're raised. And that's why it's, it yeah. presents differently from them. Like the way that our culture and society is influences those ways of thinking. And then, and, 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 and unfortunately it stigmatizes the way that boys behave and normalizes that behavior. And then it excludes another gender. You know, it excludes like the, the girls, the cisgender women who cisgender girls that, have the same issues they just look different because a lot of the times for people that don't know adhd and women it's mostly internalized and as you grow up it's all internal like you a lot of our symptoms are up here it shows up through anxiety depression frustration anger like stuff like that and and even anger in men looks different i believe i think a lot yeah. of uh, how would you say for like i mean at least for me like if i'm angry i'll cry like what what would you say how, how does a man express their anger Oh, wow. Um, that's a difficult question to answer beyond, to be honest, because yeah. everybody's slightly different. Um, mm-hmm. especially if they grew up with a, a happy childhood or not, or mm-hmm. right. if they had a parent that was strict or that was mm-hmm. relaxed, right. um, maybe they lived up, maybe they only had a mother for a for a parent, right? Or maybe they were just uh-huh. with their father. There's there's so many angles that can play into yeah. what that child's like when he becomes an adult. Um, I, I'll give you my example. Um, that's probably the best way to go about this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I grew up in a family where both sides had uh, many siblings. Uh, together there were 17 um, on both sides together Mm. and so one side was behaved a certain way and interacted a certain way and their personalities were like a and then my other side was very opposite Mm -hmm. calm more relaxed more reserved um they like to have fun, but it's in a different way. Like, yeah. Right. Uh-huh. So I grew up with two opposite uh, influences. So I had a side that was that lived in where the proper way to take care of things was speaking up, uh, using physical uh, I don't want to say violence. I mean, physical ways of, of taking care of issues and speaking out loud and getting into arguments and but at the end of the day they all get along and they're fine mm-hmm. then I, then the then the other side was keeping to yourself uh not saying anything uh hiding it until it gets to the point where it's too much and then you have an outburst and they could be mad at each other for I don't know, days or whatever. And then eventually it just kind of goes away, but they never really sit and talk about it. Mm-hmm. So there's the two different influences. And on top of it, having the trauma, um, I learned that the best way for me to express my anger was to keep it inside unless I was by myself. 
So if I was around, yeah, if I was around my, especially my father, mm -hmm. but if I was around my parents and I was angry, I would keep it to myself, but I would, you could kind of see that I was not happy. Like mm. the physical attributes were showing that I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't really describe it necessarily. Um, it's, it would kind of be like being quiet or like showing like you're yeah, not just looking at them. internalizing yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you're quiet mm -hmm. and, and you're fuming inside and you want to speak out, but you know mm -hmm. that it's not safe to do so. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you're like, when I, I would go outside or I'd go to my room or I would be out somewhere and I would express my anger and I would either like yell out or I would hit something or I would like throw something or, and I hate to admit this, but sometimes when a, when I run into something and it hurts and I, and I get upset, I, I wish pain on, on the inanimate object because that's <laughs> how I, that's how I release my anger. Right. But mm -hmm. I learned to keep it to myself and, and instead of showing it and expressing it, I would become quiet and very, or I would I would barely talk. It, it would be like one word answers. Right. It would be a lot of, and it wouldn't be, it would be, I know eye contact. There would be, it, it, you could totally tell that I was upset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that was my way. And but you're some so right. People, it's different yeah. for everybody. Some people internalize yeah. it and some people are very expressive. Absolutely. Very yeah. Very there's a lot of, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of kids out there that grow up with abuse like their, their father or mother could be an alcoholic. Uh, maybe they had their own trauma and they're bring it's coming out and mm -hmm. they're taking it out on their children, unfortunately, which is really sad. And so that child grows up and repeats that. And so instead of it being kept inside and, and, and getting stronger and boiling inside, they express it immediately mm -hmm. and they do it either through verbal abuse or, or verbal language, or they use, or they express it physically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but it's very, a very explosive yeah. uh, reaction and right away. It's, it's really yeah. interesting. It's really interesting how, how different. And, and I, and I talk about men and boys just because of like the culture, you know, that yeah. it's not that like you, you said, I, I didn't have a safe space to express my emotions. And I, feel yeah. like, I mean, that's the thing for the majority of men. Like there isn't a safe space for men, for men to discuss for boys. And like the, the question I keep asking, especially if there's a mom or a wife and I'm like, how do you make a, how do you teach your boys? How do you create a safe space for your man to be able to express and I can, if, if you, if you're like already a grown adult and you've learned, how do you unlearn that? Like, how do you s learn to express yourself in a way that is healthy? Like, cause we, they, you're not taught that. And I think even now, like, are we teaching our men how to express themselves? How to like channel their emotions in a healthy way? Like, I just don't think that's happening. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It's just like, I don't think it's happening now. No, uh, there are some, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's common, mm -hmm. um, but for the majority of boys, uh, and men today, they're still, no, it's, it, they're not getting, they're not doing it properly. They're doing it in a way that's, uh, dangerous, that's harmful, that could be, it could cause permanent uh, issues and damage in the past, whether it's in a, their relationship or whether it's to their own children, it's mm -hmm. not healthy because they, they don't have their male role model, which for the majority of these kids tends to be their father. Mm -hmm. If they have a father who's, who grew up, with this understanding that expressing emotions is bad, keep it to yourself, be tough, be strong, um, don't show weakness. If they grow up with that, that's what they know. And so they're going to repeat that. 
And unless somebody, whether that, that father or that child, when they start to grow up, unless they finally sit down and say, I can't do this, or I think this is wrong, and they change the behavior and they start saying to their child, whether it's, and doesn't matter who, if, if, if they have a, 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 a boy who's three, four years old, and they start from the beginning saying, if, if you're angry, say you're angry, express your anger. If you're sad, express your fear, express that sadness. Don't be afraid to show how you feel. Don't be scared of that. That's how it begins. Mm -hmm. Without that, it's just going to continue and recycle itself over and over and over. And you, you like said it on the money. Like it starts with being aware, being aware of, of yourself. Like, oh, I'm like paying attention to your, to the way that you're reacting. It really does start with being aware. Like that's something that's helped me. I mean, I'm to a point where like I'm too self aware, <laughs> and like it affects right. me because like I, I, it, it almost uh, like paralyzes me at times but um it does start with be, being with paying attention so like if you're a man and you're listening and start being aware of like how you react to to, to something like a, a a disagreement somebody uh criticizing you I, I mean sometimes like that hurts like if we don't handle criticism very well like what's a way like how can we learn to be comfortable with that and it starts with being aware of how you are behaving yeah. and then, okay, how can I, how can I make this a uh, proactive reaction, not a reactionary? That's, exactly. that's so, that's so important. Um, yeah. yeah. The key is, is to knowing is to, mm -hmm. is to realizing that this is what's happening, right. being aware of it in the moment and knowing what has to be done, what you have to do there in order to break that chain or break that habit and change things for the better. And a lot of times it's likely going to involve a professional's guidance to help you get there because we may see the, the steps that we need to take, but we don't necessarily know how to, to get there or how to get past the, the block right? Like, and that block could be a childhood part or a, a traumatic event that we haven't come to terms with and we haven't grown out, you know, like we haven't figured it out. If, if we haven't done that, it's, it's way more difficult to get to the point where we want to be at. Yeah. Let's talk about treatment. Sure. What, what treatment is there? How can somebody start recovering from complex post-traumatic stress disorder? All right. Well, the first thing before anything, obviously, is to find a therapist whose specialty is CPTSD. More often than not, a lot of the therapists out there who deal with um, uh, PTSD or trauma don't necessarily have training and expertise in complex trauma. So the methods that they're going to attempt to use, and there's lots and lots of evidence out there that this, mm -hmm. this, this is happening. They're going to try methods with that person. And unfortunately it just makes it worse. They don't actually help. They don't start healing. They actually makes it worse because they don't know the steps that are need are needed from from day one onwards that are mm -hmm. required in order to mm -hmm. get proper healing started because i've seen i've read I, you may have even you may have seen it on twitter possibly i see all the time uh followers or people on twitter going into uh chats or not chats on on twitter itself excuse me and saying that I, I saw this therapist and he made it worse hmm. and, or he was doing, he was trying to bring out my, my trauma part or my inner child. And I was scared out on my mind. It freaked me out. And now hmm. I feel worse. And they, they didn't do, they weren't using the correct methods 
to, yeah. to start that, that individual on the proper healing, right? Like they don't, and that's because they don't know that it's complex trauma and they don't realize that they've got parts. They have these, there's part, child parts that are not connected to the adult mm-hmm. and you got to take the right steps from and you the have beginning. To connect, and that's the best yeah. treatment you say is connecting those two and knowing, uh, like to, using a therapy form that connects those yes. two disconnected parts in the brain. Yeah. You have to, you have to communicate to them. You have to mm. feel what they're feeling. Mm. You have to like, acknowledge them, like show them that you care, that you're aware of this, of that. This is, this trauma had happened. You have to show them that you're, you're caring for them. And then you have to, then you attempt to update and make sure that, and so that they are realizing that it's a different time, things are safe. And then over time you gain their trust. And then that's the step. That's, that's what is required over time to get closer and closer to healing. So that one day, if either you won't have a trigger or if you do get triggered and you have a flashback that you're going to, the adult will always be in control and will be able to take the situation and say, we're okay, guys. This is, yeah, in the past, this was harmful. This was, this was dangerous to you, but we're safe. We're okay. And then they'll go, Mm. oh yeah. Okay. Right. (laughs) Yeah. I see. And then they just, and then they, they, they back off and the, and the adult stays in control. And that's like, that's a, obviously like an animated movie version of, of what happens, but it actually is like, like you're talking to a child. It's, it, mm-hmm. if you think about it, it was, it's like if your five-year-old child came up to you and said, Oh my God, something scared me. Like I, and they're crying or they're really f- worried. It's the same thing, right? You're, you're going to, calm them down you're gonna you're comfort gonna talk them. To them you're gonna mm-hmm. say yeah you're gonna comfort them you say it's okay you're safe there's and you go with them into the room and check the room out and say all right there's everything's fine there's no monsters you're all right and and then they start to feel safe and they trust that you made that room safe or that you made them safe and feel feel happy again that it's the same mm-hmm. thing but to that to that child self that's still in you, yeah. traumatized, basically. Yeah. If if you think about it in a in a in an interesting way, remember we were discussing the the, the pathways, the the, neuro, the neurological pathways, right? When you're talking to a five year old child in real time, and you're the adult, your mind is fully developed. You understand the reality of things and situation and you know that well one monsters aren't real mm-hmm. right blah 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 all these things now you if you could be in the mind of a five-year-old child they have a, a really wild imagination their minds are not developed nowhere near the same as as ours so there are things that they don't understand that they don't realize the reality of it and so mm-hmm. it scares them yeah. So imagine trying to show that child for the very first time that you're safe, you're okay, there's no monster of love. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're not gonna go. Oh, I get it. Yeah, right. Like they're they're not gonna mm-hmm. be able to follow in the same way. So think about it as that that neurological pathway. Mm-hmm. Over time, you repeatedly make that child feel safe. Like that real child, and eventually they start to they trust you. They gain that mm-hmm. level of trust, and they and the next time they're going to it won't be as difficult to calm them down or to show them the reality that they're safe, everything's okay. It it gets easier as you continue to do your work. So it's the same thing. It's just that instead of them physically being in front of you, now it's up here, and mm-hmm. the work's different because you you have to get to know them you have to they have to get to know you you have to have that connection and then you build that connection and it's just a slow process but it's it's the work involved that makes that one day 
down the road become reality. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like maybe those um, flashbacks don't stop, but you just um, learn to manage them. Where well, do they go away? Depending on what has been said in research, according to newer research with CPTSD and the structural dissociation theory, if you do the work and you prop, you know, you heal and you update properly and you do everything right and you do it enough times, they say you can cure yourself to the point where you don't have it anymore. And so you never experience it again. Mm. Now that's, now the thing I want to under, people understand is that doesn't mean that every single person out there who has it a hundred percent, they're all going to have it cured. And the reason is, is because it's, it's not up to the therapist to cure you. It's up to you. If you do the work, you do the, you know, I, and this is not an exaggeration. Five times a day, maybe more, even when you're, when you are triggered or when you're not triggered, if you're always updating and you're staying in touch with those parts and you're, and you're getting, how are you doing? How's your day going? Anything to mm. say, like anything that's come up, you, yeah. you listen to them. Like and checking you in say, with yourself. Exactly. And this mm. is multiple times a day, every mm. day. And that's the heart. That's the work. And if you do that work and you take it seriously and you stay with it, it will get there. It's just, it's up to you. It, no one else can do it for you. No one else can do it for you. Yeah. And I hear, I see a lot like, oh, therapy didn't work for me. And unfortunately it's because they didn't have the proper therapy or the proper therapist. There was a lack exactly. of chemistry and like all those people that probably have CPTSD and they've been getting worse because they were getting the wrong treatment and they didn't even know. Yeah. They don't this, even know that they had CPTSD. They don't even know. That's why this episode was so important for me. And I wanted to do it live because a lot of us have trauma a lot, especially after 2020. Yeah. Um, if, for me, it brought up a lot of things. And for me, like, and I was saying, everyone's like, oh, how are you coping? Like, my depression's under control. My anxiety is under control, even though I had anxiety today. But I acknowledged it. And I was like, okay, I have anxiety. I And I never do this. But like, I sat with it. And I'm like, I'm feeling anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's you, you know what this is. This is familiar. And again, I was like telling myself, you're fine. You're safe. I had to keep telling yeah. them I am. I had my own mantra. I was like, I am safe. I am well. I'm I'm home. Like, I'm. there's nothing going on. There's no reason for my body for you to be feeling this way. And it's kind of like what you were like saying. Okay. One one thing. I just want to mm -hmm. interject one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Everything there was really good. I think mm -hmm. the only thing that you could change mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other people would say the same instead of saying there's no reason for the anxiety. Okay. What you say is, cause think of it this way. Let's say, all right, you have CPTSD, you get triggered and you're having a flashback. Okay. So now your part is the one that's feeling this anxiety, feeling the stress you're overwhelmed. It's not mm. you, the adult, it's mm -hmm. your child part. So what, what you do is mm -hmm. you tell your part, I understand why you're feeling this and you have every right to feel this anxiety. Mm -hmm. It could be whatever reason, right? It could be something that you've experienced in the past that triggers this anxiety. And so you say, I understand you have every right to feel this. That's amazing. You're doing a great job. Thank you for protecting me. And then you go into saying, however, I'm you know, I'm okay. I feel good. There's no, there is no danger. We're safe. And then you, you update them, you praise them, you show them they did an amazing job. And then eventually the next time that comes up, you're going to be able to immediately go, aha, yes. And then take care of it right then and there. And then eventually it won't, it, over time, it won't come back. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, and somebody was telling me recently and they probably that's that's where it came from. Maybe. I don't know. But my right. friend was telling me that um, I needed to practice this 
two personality split two personality where I it's me there's two people inside me there's me and like though my youngest memory like and she asked right. me like what, what is the earliest memory you have how old were you and I said three years old like perfect okay it's you the adult and then there's a three-year-old version of you in your head and yeah. you want to act like act in life or like move around in life protecting that child so if something's happening somebody's asking or or trying to like impose or something like whatever interaction they're like having with you it's like they're having with the child so you are you're the parent and that's the child and you the inner you is like the child are as a mom as a parent you're going to protect that kid like no this isn't good for them absolutely and 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 that was so powerful to me to like think of myself in that way to even think of little me neglected and forgotten in the back of my mind (laughs) you know but what it sounds like what you're saying we have to bring that 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 part out be aware become aware of it and acknowledge it and talk to it and soothe it yeah it's just it's the same yeah think of it think another way i'm sure you've been in a supermarket Mm -hmm. and there have been little children who Mm -hmm. want that chocolate bar Mm-hmm. Right, and they mm-hmm. and they they grab it, and they come to their mom and say, "Mom, I I want this chocolate bar or whatever," <laughs> and the mom says, "No, you can't have that." Mm-hmm. And if the child has not been, you know, if if the the discipline is an incorrect method, they're going to burst out and and start crying or 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 de- like complain that that they want it and they're going to beg for it and the mother some mothers ignore the kid um some mothers give in and give the chocolate bar to them anyways or or and then others discipline the child in front of of everybody Mm -hmm. so each each method has its own consequences right Right. Mm -hmm. like the child gets the chocolate bar it learns that all he has to do is throw a bit of a hissy fit and he's going to get the chocolate bar. (laughs) If he gets ignored, the child eventually realizes that his efforts are futile and gives up. But if he gets disciplined, he now is experiencing a embarrassment. He may not even Mm -hmm. realize it because he's he's a child, but he he gets embarrassed Mm -hmm. because his, his mother has yelled at him in the store he feels shame. He feels sad and he feels like, Oh, I'm so sorry. And he pouts and, and cause he's a kid, he's not just going to go, Oh, I'm sorry. And, and be quiet. He's going to pout a bit. And so that right there is developing. And if it happens multiple times, it develops in their minds as a way of this is what's going to happen if this mm-hmm. if this situ- scenario occurs. So it all, yeah, it's it's how you are brought up. It's how that parent decides what they're going to do with that child. Wow. If if you're always being negative towards that child, like if that child comes up to you and says, um, or like wants attention. Mm -hmm. Right. Or wants to do something. And that parent, either because they're busy at work or they're or they're too involved in their own thing and either doesn't really say anything and goes, oh, that's great. Doesn't look at them, doesn't praise them, doesn't even say good job and didn't Mm -hmm. go back. Then that kid's going to start to think that it's pointless because their parent, A, is neglecting them and B, doesn't really care and doesn't think that they're important. And so they start to develop this idea in their minds that their parent doesn't really care about them doesn't and and there's multiple things that could occur from Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. so it's the same way like there are some therapies out there that believe that this inner critic this part is an inner critic Mm. and they some of these therapists think that the idea is to tell that inner critic that they're wrong and some people think this is a correct method of 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 working through the complex trauma but in reality that's that is incorrect because Mm -hmm. if you if you can't gain the trust of that part you'll never be able to connect with them because the more damage you do one 
the more distrust they have. Yeah. And it's going to take even longer to gain their trust so that you guys, that, that you and that part connect and heal. It's that's, that's a negative, you know, it's just like dis, a negative disciplinary action against children. It's no different. You yeah. have to, you have to show them that they're great. They're awesome. They're amazing. But you also have to show them that there's a reason or that there's a, uh, positive reinforcements even mm. if even if they're not getting that chocolate bar you're you're showing them that there are other things that they could that can happen or i like i don't that know the a exact, different way yeah. you just see yeah. a different more positive yeah. way more positive than the negative reinforcement like those negative exactly. actions a negative exactly. form of discipline wow yeah. this stuff is fascinating russ thank you so much for having this conversation i'm i'm a learn I'm learning so much from you from your podcast. Perfect, guys. Make sure that you guys are following him um, on Twitter. He is ADHD and CPTSD, but his podcast. Let me pop it up here really quick. You can follow. Uh, you can subscribe and listen to him on Apple Podcast. Uh, yeah. Is that the only place that, that your podcast is? I'm everywhere. He's everywhere. Everywhere you yeah. listen to your podcast. Go find him living with ADHD and CPTSD. He does Absolutely. do separate episodes. He doesn't always talk about ADHD. He has his CPTSD episodes and his ADHD episodes. Make sure to check that out if you're interested into this. Into this, if you think that's something that you might be struggling with, start by listening to his podcast. Educate yourself. Become aware, and then talk to your doctor. Always talk to your medical professional Absolutely. about what's going on. And so you can get properly referred to the, the, ne the necessary help and like knowing um, how to ask for help, which I'm sure that Russ goes over in his podcast. So make sure to follow him. Thank you so yeah. much, Russ. Is there anything else that you want to, us to know about CPTSD that you just like really want to like drill into us, like, like really resonate with what you have learned so far? Yeah. Uh, yes, there is. The key to healing is just like, and you think about it, positive parenting with your children. You, your role for that child is to bring them up so that they have a happy life, so that they can be at some point responsible, be able to make proper decisions learn proper behaviors, proper etiquette, proper social cues, all these different things that you, your main purpose for their life is to make sure that they have a place to live, they have shelter, they have food, they get, they are taken care of. Mm -hmm. And when they are, when they feel sad or they feel extremely happy, you're there for them to show them that it's okay, that this is life. These things happen, but you're going to be fine. It's the same deal. You want mm -hmm. you want to heal, so you have to show your parts that are in there that are experiencing these triggers and flashbacks that we're okay. Yes, what happened in the past was bad. It was horrible, and we yeah. did not deserve it, but yes. it's okay. We're going to be okay. That's what we want. I love it. Wow. Thank you so much, Russ. Again, great conversation. Thank you so Absolutely. much for teaching me and whoever listens. And guys, like I said, make sure to find him at uh, ADHD and CPTSD on Twitter and then follow and listen to his podcast, Living with ADHD and CPTSD podcast. I will link everything yeah. in the show notes and the comments everywhere. Um, and if you missed this, catch the replay. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.